All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Bazan. I am the Director of Audience Engagement at the Illinois State Museum. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's program, Coal Age Fossils, which is an NEA Big Read program inspired by the book Lab Girl. We are pleased to be a partner in this community-wide reading experience sponsored by the Academy of Lifelong Learning at Lincoln Land Community College. The members of the Academy embrace learning as a lifelong pursuit, as we do here at the Illinois State Museum. Along with the National Endowment for the Arts, we are excited to be supporting the NEA Big Read here in Sangamon County. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Melissa Party, who is Assistant Curator of Geology and tonight's speaker. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be joining you all tonight virtually. Um, I was uh, enthusiastic about doing this program because um, even though I don't study fossil plants, they are um, an interesting part of the fossil record that I have um, always had an interest in. So I, uh, as Elizabeth had mentioned, I'm the curator of geology at the Illinois State Museum. I only started this position um, back in June of 2020, so this past year. So I'm still fairly new to the Springfield area as well as the museum. Since I'm giving this presentation um, as part of the National Endowment for the Arts Big Read Sangamon County, I thought I would just take a minute to talk about how I ended up where I am, um, not just where I am you know, here in Springfield, but also how I became a scientist in general. Uh, so there are, are several themes in Lab Girl that I, I have read the book. Um, I had to refresh my memory because I read it a while ago, but there are several themes in the book that have resonated with me as a, a scientist in particular, a female scientist. Um, and I thought I would share those with you a little bit now. Um, so the first thing that really resonates with me is that I am a girl who grew up to be what I always wanted to be. And that was a paleontologist. So most kids um, have an interest in fossils. A lot of them even, you know, daydream about becoming a paleontologist someday, but most people outgrow that. Um, I, I did not. The other theme that really resonated with me in this book was, um, you know, having to pack up your life multiple times and starting over to pursue a dream. And so um, my dream, as far as science goes, started um, when I left my friends and family in Connecticut uh, to move to State College, Pennsylvania to, uh, to major in geology. And I had an interest in fossils at the time. I was one of those rare undergraduates who knew exactly what they wanted to major in within their first semester of starting college. And I got really into geology and even more into fossils while I was there. And I got my first taste of research while I was an undergrad there, so much so that I took a year off, worked a job that was a terrible fit for me, and then returned a year later to do a master's degree and uh, completed that um, uh, in the time frame that I was there. Um, at the end of that time period, I found that I was asking a lot of questions that were ecological in nature. And so I looked for a PhD program that I could explore um, ecology. And I found a program and an advisor that was a good fit all the way in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So I packed up my life um, and moved across country from Pennsylvania to an area of the country that I had not spent very much time in whatsoever. And it is probably one of the best experiences I've ever had in my life. Um, I got to meet a whole bunch of new people, experience new culture, um, and all of that great stuff. I finished up my program there and then promptly moved back to New England um, to do a two-year program doing research um, uh, that I had funding for for a brief amount of time. And then I picked up another gig um, at Vanderbilt University. So I moved down into the South, had never lived in the South before. That was also a very good experience for me. Uh, it was around the time that I ran out of funding two years later that COVID hit. And I was very fortunate because shortly thereafter, I received word that I had received an offer, a job offer to move to Springfield, Illinois. Um, 
Me moving to Illinois was a little bit ironic because um, it turned out that my master's advisor all the way back when I was at Penn State actually had a connection to the Illinois State Museum. Um, and you know, as a graduate student, you tend to think of you know, your advisors and your mentors and you know, their lives and what your life might be like and how you might be doing things that are similar to them in the future. Never suspected that I might end up in basically the same job that my old master's advisor had when he was, you know, several decades younger. So that was an interesting turn of events and life is, you know, funny like that. So this brings us to uh, the museum itself. Um, it's collections and exhibits that are on plants. The facility I work in is called the Research and Collection Center, which um, the name sounds exactly like what that is. It's where we store the collections and where we do research on those collections. Um, the objects that end up on display at the museum are the best examples we have of all of the items that the museum has. So I just want to preface this talk by, you know, stating that if you are looking for really beautiful plant fossils, head on over to the museum, um, in, in the, our, our main museum, all of the really beautiful stuff is already on exhibit. Uh, the things that are at the Research and Collection Center um, have a lot of scientific value. Um, they may not necessarily be the most aesthetically pleasing of the specimens. Now, that's not to say that we don't have good looking fossils there. Um, we do have a lot of really attractive looking specimens. Um, and actually some of them are of so much scientific value that you will never see them on exhibit. So talking about specimens where um, they were figured in a research publication, we don't want to put those behind plexiglass that we don't have access to. Um, also specimens that are um, incredibly fragile, don't want to be handling them too much. And then also specimens where it is the, you know, the type, the specimen that a species was named after. So in this talk, I'm going to um, try to give you a little bit of, of everything. Um, if you've been to the Changes exhibit, you, you probably are, are aware of the fact that we have lots and lots of really cool real objects. Um, like I said, the most spectacular of what we have in the collection. The other really cool thing about the exhibits in the museum is that they actually um, feature real research that's been done um, by employees, by curators and researchers with the museum in the past. There is also just so much stuff that you've probably walked through those exhibits and have probably missed a few things. So for this talk, I'm gonna give a little bit of background um, on coal age plants and then um, also provide a little bit of um, interpretation from what I'm calling my geology eyes or my geology perspective on what I see when I actually walk through those exhibits. So without further ado, um, let's hop in our time machine and visit Illinois at a time and place that's very, very different from the present. So what I'm showing here on this, on this next slide is what's called a geologic uh, timetable. Uh, we have, um, why is my, um, uh, sorry, I got distracted by something on my watch. Um, this is a geologic timetable. Um, it gives the, the names and the ages for different time periods uh, throughout geologic time and moving from, from the left side of your screen, you're going from the youngest times to the oldest times to the right. And so the time period we're talking about for this talk um, is where we have the overwhelming majority of the fossil plants in the Illinois State Museum are from a time period called the Carboniferous, which I've got highlighted here. Specifically, um, most of our fossils come from around this three, 320,000 uh, year time period. If we zoom in on uh, that time period, um, you'll notice the name, so the name Carboniferous, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking first. Uh, why is this time period called the Carboniferous? Well, it has the word carbon in it. So the name is referring to the high abundance of coals within the rocks of this time period. So this, um, uh, this stratigraphic column that I'm showing on the right, which I got from the Illinois State Geological Survey, um, it shows the different rocks that are present um, in Northern Illinois. And I've zoomed in on the geology of Northern Illinois from between 220, 323 to 300 million years ago. 
And this is a period of time called the Pennsylvanian. Each of the black regions that I've indicated with an arrow are coal seams. And each of these coal seams represents a luxuriant forest that existed in the past that was subsequently buried um, with sediment and compressed and turned into rock. So this is really different already from what we're used to um, in modern Illinois. And now that I've set the time period uh, that's relevant, we need to now look at Illinois's location in the past where we actually had these tropical forests. So um, just a brief overview of tropical Illinois. Illinois' location on the globe was quite different 320 million years ago. This is a reconstruction um, uh, of the placement of the continents at that time period. Um, very conveniently, Chicago has been noted here on, on this map. Um, and you can see a rough outline of the, the continents. And uh, what you should notice is that Chicago, Illinois is located in the tropics just south of the equator. Um, the other thing you should note is that much of Southern Illinois was covered by a shallow ocean. And in the time periods leading up to this, the entirety of Illinois was actually underwater for millions and millions of years. And so for the first time in millions of years, Northern Illinois was actually um, above sea level. This resulted in land uh, for new environments to develop such as forests and swamps. So forests and swamps and sets the context for understanding the fossil plants in the Illinois State Museum's collection. So we're gonna hop back in our time machine and head back to um, what would be the 1800s to quickly talk about the history of our fossil plant collections. So um, our fossil plant collections originate with the very oldest collections of the museum with the, the first director and de facto first curator um, of the Illinois State Museum. And so this is Amos Henry Worthen, who lived from 1813 to 1888. Um, Previously, prior to moving to Illinois, he was in Massachusetts and Kentucky and Ohio, but he moved to Warsaw, Illinois in 1836. Uh, uh, Worthen was a merchant and amateur geologist, um, but he was so into his um, scientific interests and geologic endeavors, he sold his business in 1850 and then shortly thereafter started with the Illinois State Geological Survey. Um, for reasons that I'm not entirely sure, the, those collections were originally housed in New Harmony, Indiana, um, but the state government of Illinois at some point decided that those should be in Illinois and they, that the state should have um, its own state museum and he became the first director. And so when he moved from the Illinois, from the geological survey, he brought all of the specimens that he had been um, working with and collecting um, with him to, uh, to Illinois. Uh, Worthen was an extremely busy person. Uh, he surveyed every county in Illinois. He mapped uh, 56,000 square miles of Illinois geology. He identified um, over 1,500 fossil species. 256 of these include fossil plant species, including many first um, descriptions of, of specimens. Um, and I'm just including this, uh, what I find to be an amusing uh, quote at the bottom that at the time when when Worthen was was building up this museum, um, an unnamed scientist of the time described as the largest and best geological museum in the West. So I mentioned that Worthen described hundreds of fossil plant species, um, but it turns out that naming of fossil plants is a little bit tricky because you almost never find the whole organism. So this results in a naming convention used by paleobotanists where every plant part that looks different gets its, actually gets its own name. And uh, this is called a form genus or, or form genera for plural, or also called a morphotaxon. And uh, this is a convention that persists to the present because of the uncertainty in the origin of the different parts of plants because when plants die, they tend to fall apart. Um, and not only when they die, just throughout um, you know, their growing season and their lives, they're, they're losing bits and pieces of themselves. And like, they tend to have parts that don't always stay cohesively together. The image I'm showing here is a picture that actually snapped this past weekend uh, going for a walk just to get some vegetation to illustrate the point I'm trying to make. 
So if you look at this image, um, there's some diversity here, but there's really not all that many species present in this one image. Um, but if hypothetically these plants were to die, fall apart, get buried, and then someday become a fossil, there are many form genera that would likely result from these plants. So there are some uh, vine-like plants that, um, that have leaves that are growing on the ground that might be described as one form genus. I can see three or four different types of um, trunks and stems um, that have different textures on them. And so if those were preserved as fossils, they each might get their own form genus name. And if the roots of these plants also look different, each of those roots would also get a name. So we really find plant parts attached to each other as fossils, but in rare occasion, we do, that allows us to see which isolated parts actually go together for the actual organism. And so this image here I'm showing um, is, is actually on exhibit in the museum. It's showing a fossil stem with the leaves attached to it. And so um, the, the stem and the leaves had been described separately, but now we know that these actually go together. So this concept of form names is really important for understanding Illinois' different coal age plants which I'm about to get into. So let's go ahead and just start with the different plants you might expect to have seen during the Carboniferous. Sorry, just so I'm gonna limit this part of the talk to the plants that are important um, in the formation of coal and those plants that have been studied by researchers at the Illinois State Museum. So this is not an exhaustive um, listing of every Carboniferous plant that's ever existed on the planet. And so this first group of plants that I'm, I'm going to be talking about are the Lycopsids, or sometimes these are called um, giant club mosses um, or scale trees. And so this is a close-up image of the bark of, of one of these types of plants. And you can kind of see from this image where the name scale tree um, would have come from. It does have this, you know, visual just appearance of um, that's very reminiscent of, you know, reptile scales. Um, this is also a really good group to sort of illustrate again what this form taxon or form genus, um, how this concept works. So this first fossil that I'm showing is um, is a species called Stigmaria. And so these would be the root structures of these trees. Um, we don't know specifically which like Lycopsid like this particular fossil goes to. Um, and it, it is entirely possible that we have, um, you know, different ones that go to different plants, but they look similar enough that we have a hard time actually uh, distinguishing which ones they go to. Moving up the tree, um, we have different types of bark. And so these look different enough that we can actually say that this one on the left, Lepidodendron, is a different type of type of plant um, than the one on the right, which um, is Sigillaria. And so these are the two trees that I'm actually showing over on the right, Lepidodendron being this very tall um, tree that um, uh, likely grew very quickly. Um, and then to the right of that um, is the Sigillaria tree, which is also a very tall tree, but maybe not quite as tall as Lepidodendron. Um, the bark is important just to note here that these plants don't have what we think of as wood on trees. So these are trees that are kind of weedy in the sense that they, they have all of their support um, from the bark. And as these trees rapid, rap, rapidly grow, they have leaves that are sticking out the side. And that's actually what these little markings are on, on the side of the bark is where leaves would have attached when the, when the plant was alive. And so this plant was trying to get as tall as possible, um, rise up into the canopy um, to produce um, this crown of leaves uh, called Cyberides and also to produce um, reproductive stru structures. So here's an example, Lepidostrobus. And so these are actually spore producing cones. And so it seems that the, the crown of these trees was primary, their primary function was for reproduction. So get really, really tall, uh, grow these structures at the top of the tree, drop all your spores, have them disperse over a large distance, and then basically that would be the end of the life of this plant and it would die. Uh, these are very strange plants. Um, 
I have a hard time imagining something that is that big that grows very rapidly within like, you know, a few years. Um, however, there are, um, despite these being strange plants, you might be familiar with one of their uh, living relatives. So there are actually ancestors of these plants that are still alive today. Um, these are the, the club mosses and they're all, they only grow to be maybe about a few inches tall. The next group of plants also have living relatives. Uh, these are the horsetails and rushes, also sometimes referred to as articulates because they have these really distinctive uh, segments with nodes that are present. So um, they kind of look sectioned. Um, and they're, they're, those, those sections and nodes are present on all the different parts of the plant. Um, some of these, so this, they're, they're still alive today. And they're, again, these kind of smaller um, plants that live kind of near aquatic environments. Um, but during the Pennsylvanian, uh, some of these grew to be quite large. So there's a recurring theme here of, you know, plants that have living relatives that are really dinky um, in the modern that, um, you know, were the giants of their time um, during the Carboniferous. And so um, the, the exhibits that we have on, uh, the exhibits that we have at the museum actually has a life reconstruction <clears throat> of this plant called Calamites. Um, it's taller than a person. It's, it's probably about 10 feet tall. Um, the different parts that I'm showing here, um, they had, uh, again, reproducing via spores. So the, the plant produces a cone-like structure at the top that then distributes the spor spores, again, getting quite tall and then dropping your spores um, to try and spread them over space. Um, they ranged in, you know, forms that looked like trees to these other um, more vine-like type of plants called Sphenophyllum. And um, I in particular picked this uh, picture of Calamites here. I'm just going to zoom in a bit to actually show that in, in the, the really detailed preservation we get um, with some of these fossils, you can actually see um, at one of these nodes between the segments, you can actually see where either leaves or, or stems where it would have been attached again in life. Another major component of coal age forests were ferns. Uh, ferns would have been very similar to the um, understory plants that we're familiar with uh, today that they would be very recognizable. Um, but we also not just see them as understory plants, but also as tree-like fo tree -like forms. Um, we do still have uh, tree ferns present on earth today, um, not in Illinois, uh, but in some tropical environments. Uh, this plant that I'm showing on the left is a living plant uh, called Dixonia. And so um, you can imagine Illinois had uh, these tree-like ferns uh, growing um, natively. Um, the, uh, one of the most common fossils in our plant collection are leaves and fronds um, from this, this particular uh, type genus, Picopterus in particular. I mean, we've got drawers and drawers and drawers of Picopterus. If I need to find a Picopterus frond, it's really easy. Um, we have many examples of fossil ferns with exceptional preservation that retain some of the fine surface details. Um, for example, I've blown up uh, the image that I'm showing here just to illustrate. You can see the veination patterns on each of these little teeny tiny leaves. Um, this exceptional preservation also captures other structures um, that are important to understanding how these plants lived. I was actually really excited when I came across this specimen in our collection, just opening drawers and looking at things. Um, the reason I got excited is because um, it preserved structures on this plant that it would have used uh, for reproduction. So if you've ever seen the underside of a fern, um, those little orange spots that are sometimes present are actually um, where the plant produces spores um, when it's reproducing. And so this fine preservation is actually able to capture some of these really important details. <clears throat> uh, while ferns were an important component of these ancient forests, there were a group of plants that superficially looked like ferns, um, but instead of reproducing, through the dispersal of spores, they actually produced seeds. So they had foliage um, that looked like similar to a fern. Um, I'm illustrating this here with this example, Mariopteris. Um, 
but yeah, as I said, uh, instead of spores, they produce seeds. So um, seeds were an important innovation in plant evolution. Um, and Pope Jaron in our book um, actually has a quote that goes well with this slide because the seed knows how to wait. So the reason this is an important innovation for plants is because seeds offer protection uh, to young plants, um, uh, to the young plants that they contain. So it's a, it's a different strategy of reproduction than the plants in the previous slides. Um, uh, where the seeds actually, where these seeds actually developed on these um, on these seed ferns is still not 100% known. Um, Initially, we thought that they possibly were forming on the leaf fronds themselves because they were found in association that way, um, preserved as a fossil. But then there was the question of whether or not they were actually attached. Um, there's other research that suggests that rather than growing on the actual leaves themselves um, or on the actual fronds themselves, they may have emerged from, um, in this image here, this tree, this reconstruction from the changes exhibit um, where these branches are emerging from the top of the plant. And just for close up, this is indeed a seed fern that's been reconstructed um, in changes. So in addition to um, seed ferns um, having tree-like forms, uh, uh, there were also forms that were more uh, vine-like and were part of the forest understory, um, such as this uh, Sphenopterus, which is also um, provided as an example in the diorama and changes um, in the museum. So this group of plants actually has no living relatives today. So this is um, not something that you would, you would potentially recognize if you were able to go back in time and wander the forest. Another close up, again, you can see the really fine detail of um, sort of what the texture of the outer part of these leaves look like. And then the last group of plants that are a major component of Carboniferous forests um, have modern relatives. Uh, these would be the early conifers, which uh, today are represented by things like pine trees, cycads. So we've all seen conifers. Um, many of the plants I've mentioned so far probably lived fast and died young um, shortly after reproducing. Uh, some of the characteristics we see in early conifers point to plants that are a little bit more long lived. Uh, rather than the support structure for these plants relying on the bark they grew, they actually developed true wood. Um, wood takes time to form and provides a much stronger support for a tree. Uh, the fossils that I'm showing at the bottom here, Artesia, this is actually, um, so the inner part of a tree trunk has a centric part called the pith. And so actually a, a cast of um, that structure from inside the tree. So it is essentially um, a fossilized um, impression of that inner part of the wood. Um, early conifers had long strap-like uh, leaves um, called chordates. Um, and so if you find any fossils that have lots and lots of little that are kind of strap-like and they have lots of uh, thin veins, uh, you might be looking at an early conifer leaf. And then, of course, um, these early conifers also produced uh, cones that produced seeds. So the plants that were alive at the, in Carboniferous forests um, ranged from forms that, you know, were probably pretty familiar to us and ranged to the truly bizarre. I still have a hard time um, conceptualizing and visualizing a club moss that's 100 feet tall that grows in a couple of years and then promptly dies. Um, there is, however, another really big difference between the plants that were alive at the time and what we think of as being typical for modern environments. And that is a total and complete lack of flowering plants, not a single flower to be had. Um, there, are occasion there are some fossils that where the leaves are arranged sort of in um, a pattern that maybe superficially looks kind of like a flower, um, but it's not a flower. So what does this mean? Uh, if, if, if you had to uh, fill your grocery store with plants that were um, of the Carboniferous time period, you would be hard pressed to find much. Um, and no flowers means no fruits, no vegetables. Um, and so this is most of the food that we're actually familiar with, the overwhelming um, 
Number of plant products we consume are what are called angiosperms. These are the flowering plants. And, you know, I'm looking out my window right now in my home office and most of the things that I'm seeing outside are also flowering plants. So going back to my, you know, joke about a carboniferous grocery store, I thought about, thought really hard about what items might be available if we limited ourselves to those plants. And what I came up with was I have seen at the grocery store um, fiddleheads. So these are the uncoiled um, fronds of ferns. I've never eaten these. And then the other thing I was able to come up with um, would be pine nuts or pinon nuts, depending on you know what part of the country and what species you're talking about. And that's about it. That's about all I was able to think of. And I um, encourage people to think about you know at the gross at the next time they're at the grocery store if there are any other examples that they could possibly think of. I'd be really interested uh, to hear what you guys have to say. Okay, so for the next part of the talk, we'll be getting into what's on exhibit and the research that is featured. Um, so fossils are the direct evidence of past life and they form the basis of, the res of research studying what Illinois' environments were like at the time. So this map shows the, the geographic extent of um, the rocks that we're talking about. So these are the Pennsylvanian rocks that are in Illinois. So again, from around 320 million years ago to 300 million years ago. And the Coal Age exhibits uh, focus at, that are at the museum focus on three main parts of our of the collection, um, and three um, sort of research areas um, associated with those fossils. So the first one I'm showing you here is um, a locality called Allied Quarry. Um, this is a upland um, deposit, um, so we're capturing plants. Uh, fossils of plants that um, are actually from upland environments rather than um, sort of near the shore. Um, these are compression impression fossils that are formed in shales. Um, and these is, this is located in Rock Island, Illinois. The second locality is also an upland assemblage um, called Spencer Farm in Brown County. Again, these are compression impression fossils in shales. What's interesting about this particular locality is um, it's a little bit earlier in age, so older um, than you know the other sites that we're going to talk about. Um, and they actually we think that it formed before there actually were extensive coal swamps um, uh, that had developed. And then the third and probably most famous of the sites that we have in our collection that we have on exhibit are. Um, these Maison Creek specimens. So these are like compression impression fossils, but what's unique about them is that they, um, they form within concretions or nodules uh, within the shales that they're found. So when you first enter the Cold Age exhibit at the museum, the information you're first presented with is that um, around uh, 323 million years ago, uh, the seas that had covered Illinois um, for millions of years has finally receded and new land emerged providing opportunities as well as challenges uh, for living things. What's not super obvious um, from this exhibit is that the evolution of land plants had actually been going on already for about 100 million years at that point, so Illinois was a little bit late to the game. Um, the very first plants on land um, occurred during a time period called the Ordovician. And so these early, early plants um, would have probably been very similar to um, mosses and hornworts. And these are plants that actually lack vasculature. So they, um, they're, very, they're limited to being very, very small, living near water. And so they don't have, what I mean, that when I say that they're lacking vasculature, what I mean is they're, they're lacking specialized tissues for transporting water and nutrients throughout the organism. So that really does inhibit their ability to get very large. The first vascular plants, so the first plants that have these special tissues for transporting water and sugars, um, show up during the Silurian. And so this, ant, this uh, plant that I'm showing here is called Cooksonia. Um, and so this was the very first vascular plant um, it and it reproduced with spores. Um, 
And then finally, I'm, I'm including this additional arrow here because um, actually the, the plants that we're thinking about in Illinois as far as the coal swamps and uh, the Pennsylvanian flora that we're developing in Illinois were actually fully developed in other places by the end of the Devonian. And so, um, so that was, but that would be around 359 million years ago. And so um, we obviously didn't have that in Illinois because we were underwater, but once we were above water, those plants could um, start to occupy um, locations on land. <clears throat> so still there are challenges to living on land that, so in spite of the fact that all of these plants had evolved and were present on earth, um, there's still challenges that to living on land that influence what types of environments different types of plants um, could live be, and become established, in particular if the land was new and had never had plants growing on it prior to that. So um, I already touched on this a little bit, but you know, if you if you lack vasculature, if you're a type of plant that that doesn't have, you know, it's called fly, uh, uh, xylem and phloem. If you don't have those tissues, transporting nutrients is going to be a challenge for you. Um, you. You have to sort of stay small, which means if you are growing around other things, they can quickly overtake you. Uh, I put gravity on this slide, which sounds like kind of a weird thing to say is a challenge for living on land. But if you think about the fact that these, these organisms evolved from species that lived in the water. When you're in the water, the water is what holds you up. Um, once you take that water, things that live in the water, if you take them out of the water, they tend to just kind of flop over. And so this ability to actually like have a shape <laughs> um, when you're on land um, is not a small feat. The other thing is, um, as Illinois was coming out from you know, being underwater, having had nothing living on land to that point, there was either no soil or very, very thin soils to begin with. So you could not be a, you know, large plant that needs deep, you know, nutrient rich soil. So the first things were these, you know, little, little diminutive plants that were then, you know, processing the soil or processing the rocks to develop the soil horizons that then allowed other plants to, to move in and live there. Um, so an adaptation to once there was more soil um, and you have this ability to transport nutrients that gets solved with the evolution of uh, Cooksonia, it can get a little bit bigger, but still it's reproduction, the motility of the spores, the dispersal of the spores was still very much tied to water. So you were able to get a little bit bigger, uh, but you, as far as reproducing and spreading on the land, you were still kind of tied um, to water. Um, these plants are also prone to desiccation, so you need adaptations on a waxy cuticle maybe on your body to prevent yourself from drying out. And then of course there is the unpredictability of living on land. The climate is um, much more, un or the environment is much more unstable on land than it is in the water. And this is where the evolution of seeds was so critical that it allowed plants to, you know, reproduce, but also like allowed them to wait until you know, ideal conditions instead of just, you know, spreading your spores and hoping for the best. Oh yeah, and so the first seeds were 30, 30, 385 million years ago. So Illinois was a mosaic of ocean, river delta, swamps, and dry upland environments. And the fossils um, that are present in Illinois have allowed researchers to learn more about how those environments were distributed over space and time. Over, over space. And so in the oceans, we have, you know, our, our marine fossils. Um, and then as we move up into drier land, uh, towards drier land, you still have primarily aquatic organisms. And then you have um, fossil plants that are kind of getting into the mix of these, um, these environments with these aquatic animals. And um, these are, with regards to the Maison Creek, the ones that we have these aquatic marine um, or organisms. Um, this is called the Essex fauna. And then the Maison Creek uh, braidwood fauna would be um, these, these primarily terrestrial fossils. Um, however, recent research has indicated that 
um, these are probably being washed out um, into these aquatic environments. So they're not necessarily um, plants, plants that are living in situ. Um, they're still in sort of a, you know, river delta environment, but they're actually being moved out and then deposited. And then um, finally, these, these plants that are present at the, in the driest environments on these um, topographic highs, uh, these would be your Spencer Farm and Allied, Allied Quarry um, fossil assemblages. So the swamp environments in our exhibit are, are largely based on fossils and concretions that have been found in the area around Coal City and around in Grundy, Will, and Canakee counties. Uh, the fossils are named for the exposure of rocks in the Maison Creek, uh, that's an actual river, um, that has eroded through these rocks. Uh, the, the Maison Creek deposits are what's called a Lagerstaden, or a sedimentary deposit that exhibits extraordinary fossils with exceptional preservation, including soft tissues. Another interesting thing to note um, about the nodules that come out of this site is um, it actually, recent research actually indicates that um, they think that the actual entombment of the fossils themselves um, probably happened rather quickly um, within months. And the largest part of our Mason Creek collections were collected by a man named George Langford Sr. Uh, he was born near Denver, Colorado, and then later moved to Joliet and then later Chicago. He was also an amateur paleobotanist and inventor, um, and he became curator of fossil plants, at the Field Museum from 1950 to 1962. Langford sent Maison Creek fossils to scientists all over, including other countries. So it's likely he's at least partially responsible for their global fame. The study of Maison Creek fossils is also still ongoing, even internationally. It's understood from the combination of marine and terrestrial fossils that the plants likely represent outwash into a river delta system from nearby swamps. Floodwaters would wash the plant remains out into the delta where they would be quickly buried and entombed. Um, nodules form in this fine grained sediment called the Francis Creek Shale, which sits atop um, a coal called the Colchester coal. And most of the fossil prospecting occurred um, in the rubble associated with coal mining. So basically what they do is they strip off the overlying rock to get to the coal seam and then fossils um, are easily accessible in waste, waste piles. However, today that's not the case. Most of the those lands are private and are not accessible to, to people easily. Okay, so although not all plant fossils are found preserved as concretions, they're often found in association with fine grained sediments that were deposited over top these coal, um, these coal beds. The reason is that coal itself is what remains from ancient swamp forests. Uh, this, the acidity within swamps um, allows the vegetation matter to actually, um, rather than decay, actually build up over time. And then what happens then is that peat, it develops, well, the vegetation is called peat. It gets covered with sediment and then over time, pressure and heat is what eventually turns this into coal. And this is a process that's repeated many times over throughout time, <clears throat> resulting in repeated sequences of coal with, with associated fossil plants. And what we often find is that in these underclays that occur beneath coal seams, we often find some of the root type of fossils. And then, then it, the, um, in the sediments of directly above, the coals, we often find these fine grained sediments that have leaves and the overstory of these plants. And then the coal itself is actually predominantly around 70% of, of what's in the coal are actually from these like hopsid seeds, uh, like, like hopsid trees. These sequences repeat over and over because of changing sea level. So as sea level, sea level falls, um, uh, you have an expanding of of land out into where that marine environment was and an expansion of this coal swamp, the deposit of the coal swamp, which would be the coal. And then as sea level rises again, you bring those marine sediments back over top of it and bury it. Um, this is a process that was actually, actually is a claim to fame of Illinois. Um, this is a, these, these cycles of rising and lowering sea levels associated with coals are all called cyclothems. And this was something that was discovered at the University of Illinois. So not all of the peat from these ancient swamps were compressed and heated into coal. There's a small part of the exhibit that makes note of coal balls. 
Um, so in some instances, mineral rich waters would infiltrate the, infiltrate the buried peat and preserve the plant material in three dimensions, resulting in concretions called coal balls. These concretions were sometimes quite large and we have an especially large coal ball at the research and collection center with my hand there for scale. These coal balls, these coal, coal balls are incredibly hard and pose a hindrance to equipment used in, in coal mining. On the other hand, though, they're, um, the fact that they perfectly preserve what is essentially ancient peat, um, they're incredibly valuable to scientists. So coal balls don't look like much until you slice them open to reveal the treasures that are hidden inside. And you can create a preparation called a peel, and you can actually look at the, um, the fossils that are preserved in these coals, these coal balls, um, in really, really fine detail, kind of like you would with a slide for a microscope. So different environments have different fossil records. Uh, shallow seas, river deltas, and swamps provide ideal conditions for fossil preservation. Um, in contrast, fossils from upland sites are rare because they tap, typically lack the deposition required to preserve fossils. Uh, much of the research on coloid plants actually at the Illinois State Museum is focused on these rarely preserved environments, specifically from a site called Allied Quarry, uh, Allied Quarry in Rock Island County and a site called Spencer Farm Quarry in, in Brown County. Uh, these upland, the upland forest exhibit at the um, museum is based on the research of Dr. Richard Leary. He was ISM curator of geology starting in 1962. Um, he's emeritus at the time, so he's actually still active with the Illinois State Museum. And there are several rows of fossils at the Research and Collection Center associated with his research. Uh, because these are upland sites, there are also um, interesting terrestrial animal fossils associated with them. One of the most prominent of these finds was this new species of scorpion from Rock Island, uh, the, uh, the site in Rock Island. So when you look at the exhibit on upland forests, um, although um, Allied Quarry and Spencer Farm are essentially exhibited together in the exhibits hall, there are some differences I want to highlight that may not be obvious. Um, so if you take a step back and actually look at these rocks, and I've drawn in a little line here, um, just to highlight the differences here, they're actually of different colors. Um, so um, although these fossils were both were found in you know, fine sediments um, uh, like shales, they actually have very different depositional environments. So um, this is not allied quarry, but is a photo I found of what I believe to be a good analog for what the river might have looked like at the time um, back in uh, the Pennsylvanian. Um, but it was essentially a really rapidly moving river that was like, down to bedrock, no deposition. And then as, as sea level started to rise, that river slowed down and then sediment started to backfill into this, into this stream as it slowed and slowed and slowed. And that's how these uh, fossil plants ended up preserved in this high elevation environment. Um, Spencer Farm Quarry, on the other hand, in talking to Richard, he was mentioning that it was basically a ravine that had been weathered into the underlying limestone and that, you know, intermittent de deposition of plants into this ravine uh, resulted in the preservation of the fossils. And he said from this, pu from this publication, about 12 meters of flat-lying Mississippian limestone are exposed topographically higher and a few meters distant horizontally, but it's evident that the small exposure of fossil bearing strata is a younger filling in a ravine eroded in Mississippian limestone. So basically what he's talking about is you could actually see what the topography was, like the actual surface um, from the Pennsylvanian, which is actually pretty exciting. The large diorama in the Coal Age exhibits is based on the research at Allied Quarry. The attention to detail in the diorama is actually pretty impressive. Um, the plants and animals depicted are the most obvious part of the exhibit, but I want to draw your attention to the background. So this um, is what I was talking about, this really rapid river, um, this depositional environment that was present at the time. So they actually included what the depositional environment was in the sort of the background of this exhibit. In the foreground of the exhibit, the plants are represented are based on what was discovered by Dr. Leary, because this is an upland site that impacts which species could live there. Um, and so um, what you're seeing in this exhibit is actually a lot of these seed ferns 
and conifers. And so these are making up the majority of the overstory or the, 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 uh, the plants that are living there. Um, and I'm just indicating just again, to drive home this point about genus forms, you're looking at one tree here, but the foliage and the trunk have two different names because they were found separately. Um, common plants are sometimes rare as fossils. So fossils such as this leaf lasia are typically rare in Pennsylvanian plant assemblages, but because this is an up, upland plant in a depositional environment that's conducive to catching upland things, it's actually quite common at the site. I had noted earlier that lycopods or the giant club mosses are one of the largest components in the peat that becomes Pennsylvanian coal. At this site, they're present, but again, this is upland. They're not the most abundant plant, which is reflected in the diorama. Um, this trunk, this upright trunk here is a lycopod, and then this trunk that's fallen over um, is also a lycopod. And included in the detail of the trunk is the leopard, like that scaled pattern that I was talking about on the bark. Um, but there, there's not real full representation of lycopods in the foreground of the diorama. Um, once again, you have to actually look into the background of the diorama to see the abundant lycopods near and around the water environments that are being shown in the distance. So I'm just going to wrap things up. Um, fossils are the direct evidence we have of past environments and how they changed over time. The coal deposits found throughout Illinois Pennsylvanian age rocks are the remains of ancient swamp forests that lived here when Illinois was tropical. Um, these are economically important but non-renewable because this was a unique period of, of Earth's history. Um, and you know, these are plants that were growing hundreds of millions of years ago. So when we burn coal, we're essentially releasing energy from ancient sunlight. Maison Creek fossils inform scientists of what plants were present near the coast. And um, the ISM exhibit on coal age plants is, in my perspective, quite unique in that it prominently features upland environments, which are quite rare. Um, usually upland environments are places of erosion, not deposition, which is why you don't get fossils there. And uh, that's all I've got. So if there are any questions, um, I'm happy to take them in the last remaining minutes that we've got. Thanks so much, Melissa. That was fascinating. and. I'm gonna have to go look at the backgrounds in that exhibit again because you <laughs> circled some things that I've never noticed. Yeah, well, yeah, when you walk up to a diorama, your first thing is to like look at what's directly in front of you, but actually there's a lot of depth and detail um, in the diorama that, that actually has a lot of really interesting and informative information. Yeah. Um... So we have, uh, someone asked, would seaweed have existed for those Pennsylvanian groceries? Yes, absolutely. That's a that's an excellent uh, catch. Um, I could have my seaweed snacks. <laughs> absolutely. Good catch. I'll have to add that to my list. All right. If you have any other questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, this uh, question came in quite early from Mark, and it is not a plant, but he was wondering if you could talk a little bit about Tully's monster. Yeah, so the Tully monster would be a part of um, the Maison Creek, right? And so it is actually part of, you know, I mentioned it's, it, the, the Maison is kind of, you know, partitioned into two parts. Um, it's part of um, the Essex fauna, which is that marine dominated, um, uh, most, of, most of the marine organisms are, are located in that part of the, of the deposit. Um, Tully monster is a weird one. Um, it's the state fossil. Um, so we've got a fantastic state fossil. Um, I think the current, so we have, we have Tully monsters on exhibit. We've got a lot of them at the RCC. We've got drawers and drawers of them actually. Um, the most, my most recent understanding of what Tully Monster was, was a relative of chordates. So those would be the organisms that lead up to vertebrates. So, I mean, it's been, it's been hypothesized to be all kinds of things, like from a mollusk to, <laughs> um, to a, a straight up fish. Like it's, it's, it's been kind of all over the place, but my understanding of the most current research is that it's it's a relative of chordates. All right, Brooke asked, how did the pre-spore plants reproduce the wart things? They actually also reproduce with spores. The other thing they do is reproduce by budding. So they, um, um, they don't, 
So they just kind of like break off a little pieces themselves and then keep growing. Um, that's um, the, the easiest explanation. All right. Let's see, we've got one more question in the Q and A. Um, so someone asked, do you let visitors make coal balls at the museum? Make coal balls. So I assume I assume they mean make the peels of the coal balls. Oh, that could be. Yeah. So um, so the coal balls form in the coal, like as a result of pressure and time. Um, so millions of years. The um, I don't we don't allow visitors to do it, but that is it would be a really interesting um, sort of outreach activity to do, and we can do things in person. I have never made a coal ball peel, but my understanding of how it works is you basically split the, the coal ball open and then you can sort of see how things are oriented. Um, and then you etch the surface um, to dissolve away the inorganic material to like, uh, so that the plants are kind of sticking up and it's it's textured. And then what you, this is not a good explanation. Then you take what's called an acetate peel and you adhere it and peel it off. Um, and that's actually, and it lifts off um, the bits of, of the fossil plants. And then you can actually like look at them under magnification and you can do this, you know, hundreds of times and, you know, not use up your entire coal ball. Um, we've never had, we've never had, I don't think, um, uh, visitors engage in that activity. I don't remember ever, ever doing it either. Um, I will ask. Really awesome. <laughs> Julie, who asked about the coal balls, also mentioned something for the grocery store, Moss Tea, which she hasn't found it here, but someone got some for her in Iceland, and it tastes very earthy. Okay, I'll have to add that to the list, too. That's interesting. I've never, I've never encountered that myself. All right. Um, Fred asked, did algae exist at the time? Absolutely. All right. I also dropped um, a link to uh, a Tully Monster um, article um, in the chat for those of you who aren't familiar with it, so you can see what a Tully Monster looks like. Um, it's not quite the monster you would think it is based on its name, <laughs> but we do have an excellent um, state fossil. A lot of a lot of slides apparently. Um, there, that's a Tully monster. Oh, there we go. Yeah. All right. Okay, I am not seeing any more questions, but if you think of something, um, quick, go ahead and pop it in the chat. But um, our, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming out tonight um, and thank, uh, we hope that your, this program has enriched your uh, experience with the NEA Big Read in Sangamon County. Um, if you're interested in more programs at the Illinois State Museum, you can check them out on our website. And of course, we encourage you to check out the full calendar of NEA Big Read events in Sangamon County as well, and that can be found on um, Lincoln Land Community College's website. Thanks to everyone who has been uh, been with us this evening. We hope you'll join us for future uh, talks and uh, programs here at the Illinois State Museum. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.